today I am wearing my symbolic black armband because we just recently learned of the passing of beloved actor Gene Wilder. If you miss out on that news, it happened like two and a half weeks ago. But yeah. We filmed these things pretty far in advance. Right. Back here in the past, we just found out. He was at a ripe old age and he was having problems with Alzheimer's, so it's sort of good that he's gone to his rest, but you still can't help but feeling a little melancholy. The world is out one Gene Wilder. I feel a certain closeness to him, not only because he stars in Young Frankenstein, the best comedy. He and I are both from the same hometown, Milwaukee. That's right. And we both attended Washington High School. Sometimes I think back to those days as a teenager, walking those same halls that he walked and maybe thinking some of the same things, having the same questions, feeling the same feelings. I just, I almost feel like it's like that Footsteps poem yeah. where there's the second set of footsteps walking next to you and it's it's Gene mm. Wilder. What, you were feeling the same thing? Did you, did you, n n did, did, I am late for biology class. <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> well, to the dearly departed Gene Wilder, I say, good day, sir. He says, good day. <laughs> I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. Here in The Basement, we celebrate September with a three-part theme, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Last time, we watched a sex movie, Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. Tonight, Craig, you get drugs. Wait, that's not right. Our movie concerns drugs. Now, this is not the first time we've watched a drug movie on this show. We've gotten high on the horse mm -hmm. with the man with the golden arm. We've tripped out on ayahuasca and sensory deprivation in altered states. But tonight, Craig, you and I are going to get lit up. We are going on a Zoom, baby. Who better to assist us with this than the cocaine fiends? <laughs> you haven't seen this? Nope. This has been on your shelf for years, hasn't it? And it's been in the cupboard for years, so you would forget about it. I didn't forget it. <laughs> it's right here, and I remember it being over there. Released in 1935, this film stars no one in particular, <laughs> and was directed by William O'Connor, who directed other exploitation classics, such as The Primrose Path, Ten Days in a Bar Room, and Confessions of a Vice Baron. The alternate title for this film is The Pace That Kills which bears an eerie resemblance to a slogan for Coca-Cola, a known cocaine drink, The Pause That Refreshes, which was introduced six years before this movie in 1929. But this movie is a remake of a silent picture called The Pace That Kills, which came out in 1928, uh, one year before the slogan. Wheels within wheels, Craig. Yeah, everything's coming together. I've said it before, Craig, and I'll say it again. Don't do the drugs. I know you like to take a drink every once in a while. Just stick with that. Did you know that people all over the world drink and that drinking can be fun? Really? I've been doing it wrong all these years. Oh, drinking games from around the world. Finally, you can drink like the Belgians. You know what would be good to store in here? Cocaine. Games. You know, oh, drinking games from around the world, man. I, I, I thought you were talking about... I, 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 don't know, I don't know what I'm saying, folks. <clears throat> Drinking games from around the world seems to be cards and dice. <laughs> <laughs> I believe there's a dreidel in there. Oh, and there is a dreidel. Go down to the corner and score a gram of prime Peruvian blow and bring it over to the old leather couch where we'll be watching The Cocaine Fiends. Oh, reading. Menace, Devil, Opes, All of the Forces. Is this movie all reading? And why are they playing Little Rascals music? <laughs> Those Little Rascals with their cocaine. The Forces Aroused, that's the next in the trilogy. <laughs> yes. The Cocaine Friends. Begins with Nick, member of a gang of dope peddlers who are being chased by the cops. Yeah, we'll get the business all right. It sounds as if they're talking through a kazoo. <laughs> So Nick ducks into a diner where Jane Bradford works. Would you like some coffee, tea, or China White? She's cute. You belong in the city. You belong in, in the, the night. night. It's in your blood. <laughs> it's in your blood. <laughs> and then the cops arrive. They're looking for him. And she protects him. Just bring us some beer. These cops are the beer fiends. <laughs> Boy, ain't she a honey? 
A hummy? You notice how flustered she was? How hot mustard she was? <laughs> I don't believe those men were highwaymen. They could have been footpads or blackguards. He takes a liking to her, she takes a big liking to him, and he says, you should come with me to the city. You're a cinch in the city. You're a cinch in the city. <laughs> Say, I know a fella that can put you in a show right away. It's called Frumpy Gals of 1935. I have such a headache. I got the grandest headache medicine in the world. Here. She takes some headache powder and she feels great. Why, that's marvelous. I can't feel my teeth. Later on, Nick and Jane are out on a date. They've fallen in love. And she's fallen in love with that headache powder. Here, take one of these headache powders. Enough with the headache powder. Get to the cocaine. I feel swell now. I feel like I probably won't sleep for about three days. We'll get married as soon as we get to town. That's a great idea. I like all of your ideas. And my, but you should hear my ideas. Jane runs off with Nick to the big city. The Great Black Way. She writes a letter home to her heartsick mother. Months pass. Her mother goes out every day to get the mail, hoping for a letter from Jane, but she never gets one. Jane's brother, Eddie, goes to the city to look for her. Eddie sends her mail all the time. In the city, Jane's not happy. Nick keeps saying he's going to marry her, but he never does. She's got to move in with this creepy blonde woman. She has all the classic shorthand of early 20th century lesbianism. If you So... You dummy, that's not headache powder, it's dope. <gasps> He's gotten me hooked on the white powder from hell. She confronts Nick about it and he says, Get out of my face, I don't like you anymore. You're going to work at the Dead Rat Cafe. I think that's what happens. The dialogue here is very hard to understand. And the plot is nigh inexplicable. You can't pull this on me, you rat! Uh, I don't get hysterical. I've only got a face like a rat. The rest of me is pure human. Except for parts of my chest. I don't, I don't quite know what it is, but it's not human. At a little drive-in malt shop, Jane sees her brother Eddie. He's working as a car hop. She runs away. He's talking to his pal Fanny. They just got paid. Fanny wants to go out and make whoopee. You know, with all this money, I feel like making whoopee tonight. <laughs> Eddie's not feeling well. I've got something that will fix that up. She reaches into her silk stocking and pulls out some of that powder. Well, Eddie's feeling great. And you want to make whoopee tonight? I want to make whoopee like, you know, I think make whoopee means. <laughs> like in a, in a newlywed game type way. <laughs> so they go out dancing that night. Here we are at the whoopee shack. Take out your touch. Then after that, give it a push. You'll be surprised you're doing the French mistake. <laughs> This is a gay old time. Hey, look, there's a famous person over there. This has nothing to do with the story. She just lost her old manager, the one that made her a star. Did he die? No, stupid. He's got another sweetheart. People don't die in Hollywood, stupid. This is a pretty boy from the drive-in. So we join the party, Dan? Who are these people? Turns out that Dan's a cop. You're just a bum sport trying to keep me from having any thrills at all. Did someone say thrills? Try this thrill powder. <laughs> While he's down there, he runs into his sister, Jane. Just, what, what, is she working down there? I, he, he doesn't know. She's like, I don't know you, man. Jane. Don't go back to the country, Palmer, and don't Jane me. Jane, I barely recognized you with that deviated septum. I came to the city to look for her in my spare time. But never at work. If I see her at work, I act like I don't know her because it's awkward. Nick doesn't like these two. Being in here, he kicks them out. Eddie gets the bill. Oh man, that is so much money. Dorothy, she's got a grand old bedroom because she's rich. And she's bored. I don't like it that you're such a floozy. But Dad, I want to live, or whatever. Because with all your money, we just don't seem to rate in society. Is this Fanny or is this the other blonde woman? I have no I think this is the other idea. blonde woman. They all look the same. All of the men are dark and lumpy. <laughs> all of the women are blonde and they have that same hairdo, except and for the, Jane. And the high cheeks. Now both Jane and Eddie are hooked. Their mom's hooked, too, on letters, and she needs a fix. <laughs> Even Eddie hasn't written for six months. Poor old lady. I just don't know what's getting into girls these days. I do. It's cocaine. <laughs> After six months of being cocaine fiends, Fanny and Eddie are fired from their jobs. At least we've got our dope. Weeks later, months later, who knows. Eddie finds Fanny in her rat trap apartment. He's been living on the street. Fanny says you can live here until you get back on your feet. Shacking up? But we're Christians. And she's like, shack up. We're coke fiends. A percolator full of drugs. Exterminate! Exterminate! <laughs> 
Fanny and Eddie are living together. Oh, that was some great sex. And the cocaine made it all the better. Oh, Did you work today? Fanny, you weren't in the room. No. I, I, I... <laughs> he really, really needs some drugs. I gotta have dope. I'm a hophead. I'd sell my soul for just one shot. Love, sister. It's just a shot away. It's just a shot away. Fanny goes out on the street and gets him his shot the only way she can. I smell bacon. Bacon, bacon, bacon. <laughs> Pretty soon Fanny's turning tricks on the regular. While out one night, Fanny runs into Dorothy and Fanny is not doing well. Here's some money. You take care of yourself now. She goes back to Eddie and says, Eddie, I got some money, Eddie. I, Eddie, I got money for you, Eddie. Yeah, I'm sick of you. You get out of here. I, don't lo I never loved you. Also, Fanny's pregnant. She gives him the money and tells him to go sleep it off. Won't you kiss me? Just once. Squonk. Fanny decides that she would rather be dead. She plugs up the door and turns on the gas. Don't turn on the gas. You'll burn up your ass just like Popeye the Sailor Man. And waits for the inevitable. It's showtime at the Dead Rat Cafe. Here's a musical number from a funny lady singer. All I want is you. And a little cocaine. I think Bono sings a song better. You say you want a diamond on a ring of gold. You say you want your story to remain untold. Eddie's gone off on a bender down to the opium den to get his own newfangled fix. Newfangled. The newfangled drug of opium. <laughs> Jane goes there and finds him. Oh, Eddie. No. He's deep into an inception right now. Eddie. You wake him up, he dies in the dream. Jane. No, not Jane. There isn't any more Jane. Only Zool. I'm Lil. A gangster's discarded mall. You need to return home to mother in the good, clean living of the country. No, it's too late for me. Yeah, it's too late for me. It's past 11. I'll get you the money. I know someone who has it. I get the feeling at the end of this movie we're going to get a stern lecture. <laughs> Eddie goes back to the apartment. You won't need a doctor. The car you see that no one enters here and disturbs anything until I get back. Not to enter the room even <laughs> if you come and get him. Boy, she is falling down on the job. Someone entered immediately. <laughs> Dorothy's been kidnapped. She was down to the dirty rat. She was down to the dead rat with her buddies, and there was a big scuffle going on. Hey, take it easy. <laughs> Punch him out. Nick kidnaps her because the big boss likes the blondes and she is the blondest of the blondes. Why, if you only listen to reason. You listen to reason, blonde number three. Hey, blonde number two, you can't talk to me like that. Quiet, I'm listening to reason. I need money. Where's Nick? I'll give you money. A thousand dollars if you'll get me out of here. Jane says, okay. She pulls out a gun. Nick shows up. Yeah, drop that cat. She says, no way, and she guns Nick down, shoots him in the belly. The police arrives. Well, who did it? I did. With my little bow and arrow, I killed Cock Robin. <laughs> We're taking you downtown. She did it in self-defense. Oh, well, that changes things. Let's have a party. Does anyone have any headache powder? <laughs> Dorothy's father shows up. Jane, or Lil, says, that's the guy, Nick. He's the head of the operation. But then the police say, nah, uh it's Dad. I well, doesn't think you're very hard, is it? You're crazy, copper. He's not harmonizing. He's harmonizing. Your phone is a mysterious big shot and brains behind all this rotten metal racket. Can this be true, Dad? It's true. You are a racketeer. All this time I thought you were a rocketeer and I was looking forward to rocket rides. Or a musketeer. I was looking forward to a mustache ride. <laughs> There was a girl in an earlier scene who keeps looking at boys, and she's talking to the cop who did the arrest, and the cop says, Now you see what happened? And she says, I do, and I'm in love with you. Toop toop! The cocaine fiends! The cocaine fiends, those little devils. One thing you can say about them is that they're completely headache-free. Except the teeth grinding will only cause more headaches. Well, I get the feeling, one, that this is the only surviving print of this movie because it's in terrible shape. But yeah. I get the feeling that this has been censored, that there have been a lot of scenes that have been cut out of it. Because oh. it's so tame. And you don't see anyone doing anything on cocaine that 
you normally see in movies about people who are hooked on cocaine. There's things that are kind of implied, but none of them so risque. When but... she takes the thing out of her stocking, that's probably the most risque thing of the yeah. entire well, movie. When Fanny goes off to sell herself, it's done, you know, very subtly. You know, I want to talk about Fanny for a second. I found her subplot very sad. She actually was kind of a decent actress. They give her a very long shot of her contemplating her suicide. She's really going to do this. There's a comparable scene in the movie Dinner at Eight. John Barrymore is also contemplating suicide. I didn't think anyone in this movie would remind me of the great Barrymore. She's really got range. Like when yeah. she's the car hop, she's got this sense of innocence, but also, hey, let's do this illegal thing. Yeah, it's, here's a fun thing we can do. Yeah. This is a bad movie. But it has some good qualities to it. In better hands, these actors could have done something. And it's not laughably bad all that often. Like yeah. Reefer Madness is, like any number of exploitation movies are. And it doesn't make you feel like, hey, well, maybe cocaine would be a good idea. Because <laughs> you watch Wolf of Wall Street, which the more I think about that movie, the more I hate it. Don't do drugs. It's like, well, do drugs. Drugs are pretty awesome. I don't know that I would agree with that assessment of it, but uh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Here's a little fun fact. Eddie's bill at the Ritzy restaurant is $9.79. Mm -hmm. If I was you, I wouldn't pay it. Today, adjusted for inflation, that bill would be $172.25. And I think they had six drinks. You've been to places in New York where it's like that. I've had ill-advised $22 shots of cognac. Yes. <laughs> so much of this plot was so hard to follow. There were characters that came in and out. Mm -hmm. You didn't know who they were. If they said their names, you couldn't understand it anyway. You know what my favorite bit of dialogue was in this movie? It was this one. <laughs> I think a lot of actors were singing through a megaphone just like the guy on the stage. Cocaine is a plague... And where do they hang out? The dead rat. Mm. And that's where plagues come from. Nice. If the rats are alive, nothing to worry about. Just keep eating. The rats are dead. Now you got the plague. Exploitation movies. What are they to you? A cautionary tale that revels in its own luridness. It condemns the vice and also celebrates it in a weird way. It's a movie that's... Selling point is a subculture. Okay. Biker movies exploit the biker culture. Drug movies exploit the drug culture. Bearing all that in mind, was this a good exploitation movie? Yeah, I wouldn't call it a good exploitation movie. It's too dry. Would it be possible for anyone to make a good movie about the perils of cocaine in 1935? John Ford. Would they have been able to make this movie? How white was my yayo? <laughs> A John Ford film. Well, anything's possible. I mean, cocaine was in wide use back then. So much so that it was a problem. There are many blues songs about cocaine. One mm -hmm. of my favorite, Cocaine Blues by Luke Jordan, a very little-known blues man, Piedmont Blues. Cokes for horses, not women or men. The doctors say it kill you, but you don't say when. That's a cautionary tale. You know, oh, yeah. This stuff is great. And the man with the horns came and took all my furniture. Yeah, yeah. It's, it really veers between celebrating cocaine and also, like, my life is in a shambles. Yes, if you want to hear that song, it was just posted on Wednesday on our Facebook page. Final thoughts on the cocaine fiends. Yeah, they're going to get you. I wanted a so bad it's good movie. Yeah. You got not bad enough, not good enough. Yeah. I've got a really terrible headache and oh, just wish yeah. there was something for it. I'm glad you brought this up, talking about our website. How's that for a segue? Welcome to TheBasementShow.com. Our viewers can go there and see all of the episodes we've ever made, and there's a PayPal donation button. You can donate a few dollars to support our show. We promise we won't use it on anything that is contraband. Yes, you have the Welcome to the Basement guarantee. Wink! You can make a rolling monthly donation or a one-time donation, just like Alfred did, for the wellspring of thought-provoking commentary and entertainment that never fails to be funny, insightful, and fantastic. Thank you. And thank you, Alfred. And thank you all. There are other ways that people donate to our show. They send us stuff to our P.O. box. If you want to find out the exciting contents of that and who the rest of our donors are, you can watch Unboxing, which is happening this coming Friday. Unboxing, and then we do this show, and we alternate. And that's how we do it here in the basement. That's how you get your fix. Hey, don't bring up fixes. First it's free. Then they start donating. 
And then they just can't stop. They want the Roly Monthly donation. <laughs> I need it. Don't you understand? I need a shot of seen it. Seen it? Well, we are currently in mourning here, but we are going to go away from that off into a world of pure imagination where we pay tribute to the film work of Gene Wilder. Karen Hebert writes, Now this means you need to watch the craziness of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Beautiful stuff. Not to be a pedant, but it's Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. The burden one is Charlie. But we know exactly what you're talking about because we've seen it. People don't talk about how riotously funny the first half of this movie is. Charlie's teacher? I can't do two! <laughs> that guy's a really famous British comedian. Like, he's a really beloved British comedian. Yeah. You know, this might be Gene Wilder's coolest performance, mm -hmm. but he still gets to pull out the Gene Wilder-ness. Yeah. Particularly at the end of the film. Those last two minutes, he's all over the place and he just hits all the notes perfectly. And how friendly and magnanimous he is, even when he's being cruel to children. That's how you have to be cruel to children, by being like Willy Wonka. They'll love you for it. <laughs> Jason Burge writes, See No Evil, Hear No Evil is a, an underrated comedy classic. Seen it. Not seen it. You had cable? How could you not see this movie? Maybe I was blind, Matt. <laughs> what? The teaming up of Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor is a strange pairing, and it's surprising that they did so many movies together. Apparently they weren't buddies. No. Like, they didn't really hang out. I can't imagine Gene Wilder being like, yeah, sure, I'll come over and watch you do a bunch of cocaine. <laughs> I'm not going to partake, but you go ahead. It's your thing. They're complete opposites. It works perfectly. And Kevin Spacey is in this movie. Is he? Yeah, he plays a killer. Good old T.A. Epley writes, When Mel Brooks accepted his Oscar for Best Original Screenplay for the producers, he thanked a few people and ended by saying, I'd also like to thank Gene Wilder, and I'd also like to thank Gene Wilder, and I'd also like to thank Gene Wilder. So the producers, seen it. Me and my sister, and for some reason my dad, accidentally happened upon this movie on cable. And we were screaming. My sister Kendra and I would watch it all the time. We had the movie memorized for a while. Gene Wilder and Zero Mostella are like a binary star in that. And they're yeah. just like feeding off of each other's gravity. And they just keep spinning faster and faster and faster. And it keeps getting funnier and funnier and funnier. Dave Durbin writes, I was lucky to catch an outdoor viewing of Bonnie and Clyde a couple of months ago. It was raining that night, cold, windy. The crowd was made up of mostly of semi-interested college kids. But when Gene Wilder appeared on screen, people applauded. They applauded again when his character said he was from Wisconsin. And Wilder's in it for five minutes tops, and he is solid the entire time. Just bubbling and mirthy and, like, terrified all at the same time. It's a nice bit of comic relief for the movie. And I just went back to it a couple years ago for a second time, and it's, it's really, really good. It's so raw and bloody. Not, not just the final scene, but throughout. But also the fact that it's addressing impotence and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. And it has one of my favorite moments in any movie. Clyde catches up with his brother after years of being apart, and they're like, oh, yeah, and they're like slapping each other on the shoulders and everything, and they sit down, and... They suddenly realize they have nothing to say. You know, it's this awkward moment. It's an unnecessary thing, but it, like, it's, it's so real. Just makes the movie come alive even more, even though that's not an essential plot point. Faye Dunaway is so sexy in that movie. But the thing is that she was on a starvation diet. It's like, pe girls weren't that skinny on purpose, so she was in a lot of pain while filming that. Starvation diet killed Zero Mostel. Did it? That is seen it. That's our show. We watched the cocaine fiends. They got all hopped up on the dope. We hope that you don't do that. And we hope you'll come back next time for the rock and roll portion of Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll. The conclusion of September. Not everyone can have sex. Not everyone can have drugs. But we can all share rock and roll. We'll see you then. Good night. Tomato. Someday I be Broken bottle. Sailing Coke spoon. Dead rat. Yeah. Jane. <laughs> if you love me. Can't think of anything else to throw. <laughs> Nothing will get this guy off stage. I gotta have dope. I'm a hobhead. And then Alice starts to take off her clothes. Let me introduce you to the canons of Diane Cannon. You all know what we came here for. Orgy! Have an orgy! 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 Would you like to go to bed with me? Well, uh, when you put it that oh, bra. On, and they all come to realize... Alice is absolutely right. Come on, man. It's Vegas. I'm not going to say it.
I'm not going to say it. I know you love her, man. That's not in question here. Me? You like me and my Willy Wonka outfit? If you don't like my Willy Wonka outfit, then good day, sir! <laughs>